In this video, we're going to start talking about homomorphisms. If you remember back to our very first video in this series, called What is Abstract Algebra, you might remember that we said that abstract algebra is, number one, the study of sets with algebraic structures satisfying certain properties, for example, groups, and number two, maps between these sets which respect this algebraic structure. The maps between these sets which respect the algebraic structure are called homomorphisms. And in this video, we're going to talk about homomorphisms of groups. One item of good news is that if you understand homomorphisms of groups, then later on when we talk about homomorphisms of other algebraic structures, such as rings and fields, it'll be pretty easy for you to understand those as well. Here is the definition of a homomorphism of groups. Let's suppose that we have two groups, G and H. And just for the sake of clarity at the beginning here, let's write the binary operation on G with a circle, and let's write the binary operation on H with a star. Well, a map phi from G to H is called a homomorphism from G to H if it satisfies the property that, for every pair of elements x and y and g, phi of x circle y is equal to phi of x star phi of y. In other words, phi is a homomorphism if it has the property that whenever you combine two elements in g using the binary operation in g, and then map them to h using the map phi, you'll get the same answer as if you had mapped the original two elements to h, and then combined them in the same order using the binary operation in h. Remember here that the order that we're combining the elements on the left and on the right hand sides of this equation is important in general, because in this definition we're not assuming that the groups G and H are abelian. Okay, well there are a bunch of extra properties that a homomorphism phi from G to H may or may not satisfy, and I like to go ahead and collect together some of the more common ones here before we go on. So first of all, if phi is a homomorphism which is injective, then we may also call it a monomorphism. And if phi is surjective, then we may call it an epimorphism. Now, if phi is both injective and surjective, so that it's bijective, then we call it an isomorphism. And we say that the groups G and H are isomorphic, which we denote by the usual way, as introduced back in our video about groups of orders 1 through 3. I'll also mention at this point that this definition of isomorphism agrees with the definition that we originally gave, that two groups are isomorphic if and only if there's a bijective map between them, which preserves their multiplication tables. That definition is a little bit difficult to work with, but with this definition, it's a lot easier to check whether or not a map phi is an isomorphism. Finally, if I have an isomorphism phi from a group G to itself, then I might also refer to it as an automorphism of G. Now, all of these terms are good to know, and I'll try to remind you what they mean as we go on, but the most important ones to remember are homomorphism, isomorphism, and automorphism. Now I'd like to spend a good amount of time looking at examples. For our first example, which I'm going to call example number zero, let's suppose that G and H are any two groups. Well then, there's always a homomorphism phi from G to H, which is the homomorphism defined by the rule that phi of G is the identity in H for every little g in G. This homomorphism is called the trivial homomorphism from G to H. And just for practice, even though this is an easy example, let's check that it's a homomorphism. So choose any two elements, x and y and g, and think about what phi does to the product of x and y. Well, whatever you feed into phi, it always spits out the identity element, so that was easy. Next, the identity element is equal to the identity element times itself, and I can also write the right-hand side as phi of x times phi of y. Well, that's precisely what I wanted to show, that for any x and y and g, phi of xy is equal to phi of x times phi of y. So it shows that for any two groups g and h, the map phi from g to h defined in this way is always a homomorphism. Note here that I've already stopped writing circles and stars, because it would be annoying to have to write those in every single example. So instead, as usual, I'm usually going to suppress the binary operation and just write my groups multiplicatively or additively if that's more natural for the groups in question. For the next example, let's let g be the group of real numbers under addition, and let's let h be the group of positive real numbers under multiplication. At first glance, these two groups look different, but it turns out that they're actually isomorphic to each other. So the first question is, can you think of an isomorphism, or even just a homomorphism, from G to H? This needs to be something which maps addition on the left-hand side to multiplication on the right-hand side. And if you think back to calculus, you'll probably be able to come up with such a map. It turns out that the map phi of x equals e to the x does precisely what we want here. 
And to see that, let's suppose that x and y are real numbers, and let's think about what phi does to x plus y. By definition, phi of x plus y is e to the x plus y, and by properties of exponentials, that's equal to e to the x times e to the y. But by the definition of phi again, that's equal to phi of x times phi of y. And the two quantities on the right hand side are being combined using multiplication, which is the binary operation in the group on the right. Therefore, this map phi is a homomorphism of groups. Now, another thing which I hope that you remember is that the exponential map is a bijection from the set of all real numbers to the set of positive real numbers. And since this is a bijective homomorphism of groups, it's an isomorphism, and it means that these two groups are isomorphic to one another. This is a prototypical example of a homomorphism between two groups. Next, let's let G be the group of two by two real matrices with non-zero determinant under multiplication. And let's let H be the group of non-zero real numbers under multiplication. Remember that G is the group that we call GL2R, and it was one of our first examples of a non-abelian group. Well, in this case, can you think of a non-trivial homomorphism from the group G to the group H? Well, it's not difficult to see that one natural example is the map which takes a matrix A to its determinant. And to see why this is a homomorphism, let's suppose that A and B are any elements of the group G. And let's think about what phi does to the product of A and B. By definition, phi of AB is the determinant of the product of the two matrices A and B. And by properties of determinants, the determinant of a product of two square matrices is the product of their determinants. But the right hand side here is phi of A times phi of B. So this calculation shows that the map phi is a homomorphism from G to H. Now in this case, you might also notice that because for any non-zero real number, there's always a matrix with that determinant, the map phi is surjective, so it's an epimorphism. But since there's always more than one matrix in G with any given non-zero determinant, phi is not an injective map. Therefore, it's an epimorphism, but it's not an isomorphism. For our next example, let's let G and H both be the additive group of integers. Then let's let little n be any integer, and let's define a map phi from G to H by the rule that phi of k is n times k. So this is just the multiplication by n map on the group of integers under addition. Well, for any integers k and l, phi of k plus l by definition is equal to n times k plus l. And by the distributive property, that's equal to nk plus nl, which is phi of k plus phi of l. Therefore, phi is a homomorphism. Well, now, let's try to figure out whether or not this homomorphism is injective and or surjective. It's pretty easy to see that the answer depends on our choice of n here, because, for example, if n is 0, then this map phi is just the trivial homomorphism, and it's neither injective nor surjective. But if n is plus or minus 1, then it's both injective and surjective, and so it defines an automorphism of the group of integers under addition. And finally, if n is any other number besides 0 or plus or minus 1, then the map phi will be an injective map, but there will always be some integers in the codomain that it misses, so it won't be surjective. For our next example, let's let g be the group of integers, and let's let h be the group of integers modulo n for some natural number n. Note here that I'm already moving away from saying what the binary operation is, and I'm using our convention that when the binary operation should be clear from context, you should just assume that that's what the binary operation is. So here I'm talking about the integers under addition, because multiplication doesn't turn the set of integers into a group, and so there's not another binary operation more natural than addition. And similarly, when I talk about z mod nz, the binary operation is also addition of residue classes modulo n, since multiplication of residue classes modulo n is not going to turn this into a group unless n happens to be 1. Okay, well, let's define a map phi from g to h by the rule that phi of any integer k is equal to the residue class of k modulo n. Well, then, it's pretty easy to see that phi is a homomorphism of groups. And to see that, just think about what phi does to a sum of two integers. By definition, phi of k plus l is the residue class of k plus l modulo n. But by the definition of addition of residue classes, which we know is a well-defined binary operation on z mod nz, k plus l bar is k bar plus l bar, which is phi of k plus phi of l. Therefore, the map phi from z to z mod nz defined in this way is a homomorphism. It's also pretty easy to see in this case that it's surjective, so it's an epimorphism. But it's not injective, because, of course, for any residue class, there are infinitely many choices of representatives which map to that residue class under this map. The next example is one that is long overdue, but one that we've also somewhat established, and which should be pretty familiar from previous videos. 
So what I want to show in this example is that any two finite cyclic groups of the same order are isomorphic to each other. So in order to do that, let's just show that if you have a cyclic group of order n written multiplicatively and generated by an element x, say, then it's isomorphic to the additive group of integers modulo n. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to define a map phi from the group Cn to the group Z mod nz by the rule that phi of x to the k is k bar modulo n for any integer k. At this point, I'd like to remind you of some basic facts about cyclic groups that we established in our video about subgroups. The first fact is that the group G here is a group of order n whose distinct elements are the identity x, x squared, and all the powers of x out to x to the n minus 1. And the second fact is that any time you have two powers of x which are equal to each other, then that implies that their exponents are equal modulo n. And conversely, any time the two exponents are equal modulo n, that implies that the two powers are equal to each other. The second property here guarantees that our definition of phi is well defined. Because remember, in a finite cyclic group, there are many different ways to represent every element. So the identity is the same as x to the n, is the same as x to the 2n, and x is the same as x to the 1 plus n, is the same as x to the 1 plus 2n, and so on. But the fact that two powers are equal to each other in the cyclic group if and only if the exponents are equal to each other modulo n means that what you get on the right hand side here will be the same as long as you plugged in the same element of the cyclic group. Okay, well, now that that's out of the way, let's think about what happens when you multiply together two elements of this cyclic group and then apply the map phi. First of all, by properties of exponents, if I have x to the k times x to the l, that's x to the k plus l. And when I apply the map phi to that, I get the residue class representing k plus l. But just as before, that's the same as k bar plus l bar. And now I recognize that that's equal to phi of x to the k plus phi of x to the l. So since phi took two elements of the domain, combined using the binary operation in the domain, and outputted the images of those two elements, combined using the binary operation in the codomain, the map phi is a homomorphism of groups. Well now, it's pretty easy from the properties here to see that this map is also a bijection. So that means that it's an isomorphism, and that shows that the cyclic group of order n is isomorphic to the additive group of integers modulo n. Now, since any two cyclic groups of order n have a presentation like this, they're both going to be isomorphic to z mod nz. And since isomorphism is an equivalence relation, this shows that any two cyclic groups of order n must be isomorphic to one another. For our next example, let's let n be a natural number and let's let g and h both be z mod nz. Then, let's choose an integer a and let's define a map phi from g to h by the rule that phi of k is equal to a k modulo n. First of all, let's show that for any choice of a, this map is always a homomorphism. So if k and l are any two integers modulo n, then phi of k plus l by definition is a times k plus l. And by the distributive property for addition modulo n, that's a times k plus a times l, which is the same as phi of k plus phi of l. Therefore, phi is a homomorphism. Now let's try to determine for which values of a this homomorphism is injective and or surjective. To determine when this map is injective, let's suppose that k and l are two residue classes modulo n with the property that phi of k is equal to phi of l. By definition, that means that a k is equal to a l modulo n, and rearranging this equation, we have that a times k minus l is 0 modulo n. Now we'd like to just divide both sides by a, but remember that division isn't always possible when you're working modulo n. And you can see our video about integers modulo n if you want to remember how that works. But the key to solving this equation is, first of all, that it's only going to have a solution for integers k and l if the GCD of a and n divides the number on the right-hand side. Well, since the number on the right-hand side is 0, that's always going to happen. So in order to go further here, let's write d for the GCD of a and n, and let's write b for what you get when you divide a by that GCD. Then, looking back at our video on integers modulo n, we see that the top equation will be satisfied if and only if b times k minus l is 0 modulo n over d. But now, since b is relatively prime to n over d, this is only going to happen if k minus l is 0 or if k is equal to l modulo n over d. Okay, well now, let's think about what this means in terms of the injectivity of the map phi. If the GCD of a and n happens to be 1, then n over d is equal to n, so the only time that two points k and l can get mapped to the same point by phi is if they're actually equal to each other modulo n. So if the GCD of a and n is 1, then the map phi will be injective. On the other hand, if the GCD of a and n is bigger than 1, then it means that n over d is strictly less than n, 
And in that case, it will be possible to find two residue classes K and L modulo N, which are not the same modulo N, but which are the same modulo N over D. Think about, for example, if D is two, then as long as N is greater than two, I can take K to be one and L to be one plus N over two. And I'll have two different residue classes modulo N that are mapped to the same point by phi. Therefore, that also gives us the other implication here, that if the map phi is injective, then it must be the case that the GCD of A and N is equal to one. So this homomorphism is going to be a monomorphism if and only if the GCD of A and N is equal to one. Now let's talk about whether or not this map is surjective. And here the story is pretty similar. It depends on what A is. So to determine whether or not it's surjective, we want to know, for any L in Z mod NZ, is it true that there's a K in Z mod NZ with the property that phi of K is equal to L modulo N? Well, that's the same as asking whether or not there's an integer K with the property that AK is L mod N. And we know that a necessary and sufficient condition for this equation to be solvable for every choice of L is that the GCD of A and N is equal to one. So that guarantees that if the GCD of A and N is equal to one, then the map is surjective. And just in case you're wondering why this is necessary and sufficient for this equation to always have a solution, just think about what happens if the GCD of A and N is bigger than one. In that case, A is not invertible modulo N, which means that there's no integer K with the property that A times K is one mod N. Well, that's the same as saying that one is not in the image of the map phi. So that means that if the map is surjective, then it must be the case that the GCD of A and N is equal to one. Well, now we've completely solved this problem, and we can sum up our discoveries in two points. First of all, if the GCD of A and N is one, then this map phi is an isomorphism, therefore it's an automorphism of the group Z mod NZ. On the other hand, if the GCD of A and N is bigger than one, then phi is still a homomorphism, but it's neither injective nor surjective. Finally, we have a pretty important and commonly occurring example. And in this example, we start with the group G in an element little g of G and we define a map tau sub g from g to g by the rule that for any h and g, tau sub g of h is g times h times g inverse. This map is called conjugation by g, and please remember that the order of the multiplication in general does matter here. If we're working in an abelian group, then of course we can interchange the orders of the multiplications here and the g and the g inverse will cancel out, but in general in a non-abelian group that may not happen, and that's where the map becomes interesting. Well, first of all, let's try to show that this map is always a homomorphism. And in order to do that, let's choose two elements, h1 and h2 of g, and let's think about what the map tau sub g does to the product of h1 times h2. Well, by definition, it just takes that product and left multiplies by g and right multiplies by g inverse. And since we're trying to get this to look like tau g of h1 times tau g of h2, the trick that we want to use here is to insert a g inverse g between the h1 and the h2 in this product. Of course, g inverse times g is just the identity, so I haven't changed the product. But now if I group the terms by multiplying the first three and then the next three, I recognize that that's tau g of h1 times tau g of h2. Therefore, this map is always a homomorphism. Next, to determine whether or not this map is injective, let's suppose that I have elements h1 and h2 and g with the property that tau g of h1 is tau g of h2. Well then, by the definition of tau g, that means that g times h1 times g inverse is the same as g times h2 times g inverse. But now, if I left multiply both sides of this equation by g inverse, I'll cancel out the g on both sides. And if I right multiply the equation by g, I'll cancel out the g inverse on both sides, leaving me with the equation that h1 is equal to h2. That means that conjugation is always an injective map. Finally, let's see whether or not it's surjective. So in this case, we want to decide whether or not every element k of g is in the image of this map. Well, you need to do just a little bit of scratch work to kind of reverse engineer the problem. But after not too much thought, you're going to realize that if you take h to be g inverse times kg, then when you compute tau g of h, you get that it's g times g inverse times kg times g inverse, which after rearranging just becomes k. Therefore, every element of g is in the image of this map, so it's always a surjective map. And now that we know that this is a homomorphism from G to G, which is both injective and surjective, we conclude that the map tau G is always an automorphism of G. As I mentioned before, if G happens to be an abelian group, then this automorphism is not very interesting because it's just the automorphism that maps every element H to itself. But when G is not abelian, conjugation by elements of G provides us with a very useful collection of non-trivial automorphisms of the group. That's the reason why this example is important, and it's something that we'll return to in a later video. Okay, well, that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. 
In the next video, we're going to continue and talk about a few basic properties of homomorphisms.